So, um, as I was saying, uh, last week we uh, kicked off our multidisciplinary exploration of the forest, the third part of the Humanities Centre's three-year series uh, on natural landscape and human meaning. And today uh, I am uh, delighted to introduce three colleagues, all faculty from USD's Department of Art, Architecture and Art History, who will, in their own ways, share with us their reflections on the representation of the forest. So a brief word about each of them, and then we'll go over to them. In, in alphabetical order, uh, Derek Cartwright received his PhD from the University of Michigan, and in a multi-dimensional career, has both taught art history and directed art museums in, among other places, Seattle, Giovanni, and Hanover, as well as directing USD's own network of galleries. He currently serves as Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Timken Museum of Art in Balboa Park. Uh, a prolific writer, his research has included studies of Benjamin West, Robert Henry, and American women photographers of the early 20th century. In his role as Humanities Center Gallery Element Chair, Dr. Cartwright has been responsible for the stunning range of exhibitions that have been staged since 2016, including the recently opened exhibition of photographic work by Gregory Trudson, Forest Fables, which if you haven't seen yet, you really should see it. It's a very, very clever place to be. And actually, I, I'd just like to thank, and I, I mentioned in last week's thank Diana and Susan Smith for, for their help in putting together this, uh, this great exhibition. So thank you again. Uh, Farah Karapetian was educated at Yale University and her, earned her MFA at UCLA. Her photographic work, reproduced in multiple textbooks and held in public collections, including the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art San Francisco, has been described by the Los Angeles Times as a marriage of, and I quote, two traditions in photography, that of the staged <coughs> picture and of the image made without a camera. Her public art projects... <coughs> I was going to choke for a second. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't respond well, it's <laughs> <don't> great. <laughs> Her public art projects have been recognized by various civic organizations, including the California Legislative Assembly and the City of Los Angeles. And she has held fellowships, including a Fulbright scholarship in both Russia and Uzbekistan. She is the driving force behind the Humanities Center's powerful series, Frontiers in Frontiers. And Sally Yard received her PhD from Princeton University and has been a member of USD's faculty since 1989. A specialist in 20th and 21st century art, her research interests stretch from the emergence of abstract expressionism in the United States to the relationship of art and its publics, whether in the San Diego Tijuana region or in the reflective realm of a museum garden. Her published work has included studies of the artists Robert Irwin, Willem de Kooning, and Francis Bacon. Dr. Yard is founding director and board member of the Collaborations of Teachers and Artists, a program that links artists and elementary school teachers in the school districts of the San Diego region. She has curated exhibitions for institutions throughout the United States. Well, I'm very excited to hear what our speakers have to say today, uh, so please join me in welcoming Derek Cartwright, Farah Karapetian, and Sally Yard. First, I want to thank Brian for the invitation to speak in this series and also uh, express my gratitude to Lindy Via and Maggie McCrae for all their organizational efforts. Everything that happens here is so wonderfully put together by both of them. And I'd also like to thank all of you for being with us. So this is a talk on Winslow Homer, the American painter Winslow Homer and his elegies to the New York woods. And when I was thinking about what I might say in this series, I was remembering Alex Nemirov's recent incantations about the forest in the American forest in the 1830s. And I was thinking about what I know of Sally and Farah's interest in contemporary practice. So I thought I would try to 
find something in the middle, and that led me to the great American misanthropic artist, Winslow Hine. Um, so I, I think you probably, some of you anyway, will be familiar with images like this one called The Old Settlers, which has these two bears lumbering through the forest. And I'll be talking about the specific locale in which this happens for Homer in just a few moments. But before I do that, I want to just situate this a little bit in the context out of which I think Homer explores the American forest. And I know you all have this poem memorized already, so I don't know why I'm going to <laughs> read it, but I think I will. Um, it's by William Cohen Bryant. And if you can hear this painting of a kind of homage to him and then the artist, American artist Thomas Cope called Kindred Spirits, which purports to put them together in this kind of idyllic setting. So I'm going to truncate this because, again, you know it already, but um, I'll read a little bit of it. And I want to sound like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger, if thou hast learnt a truth which needs no school of long experience, that the world is full of guilt and misery and hast seen enough of all its sorrows, crimes, and cares to tire thee of it, enter this wild wood and view the haunts of nature. The calm shade shall bring a kindred calm, and the sweet breeze that makes the green leaves dance shall waft a balm to thy sick heart. Softly tread the marge, lest from her midway perch thou scares the wren that dips her bill in water. The cool wind that stirs the stream in play shall come to thee like one that loves thee, nor will let thee pass ungreeted, and shall give its light embrace. So I think this really sweet, welcoming idea that nature wanting to receive us all and make us at home in it is something that's part and parcel of what American artists expected when they made their trips up the Hudson River Valley in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s. My argument today is that by the time that Winslow Homer gets there, it's a completely different place. So what do we know about Winslow Homer? I'm not going to bore you with a lot, but we know he grew up in Boston. Um, his mother probably taught him to be a painter, and she was herself a gifted watercolorist. His father was pretty much a bum and uh, left the family when he was 14, and Homer sort of made his own way from there, but uh, becomes this you know, successful illustrator working in New York City in the 1850s, doing commercial illustrations for the mass market magazines that really defined what American literate culture was, in the East anyway, at that time. He goes to France very briefly, comes back, and really enjoys significant success. Um, he goes again to Europe in the 1880s, goes to this little British fishing village, does these uh, uh, wonderful works there, but then comes back, leaves New York, and ends up living as a recluse in Prout's Neck, Maine, for the remainder of his career. And that's what Winslow Homer looks like in 1863, when he gets sent by Harper's Weekly to the battlefront of the Civil War. And so he's uh, a special correspondent for Harper's Weekly doing images like this one of a sharpshooter nested in the trees. These are highly specialized marksmen who waited for hours in these treetops for, in this case, a rebel um, combatant to pass by, and then they would uh, ruthlessly kill them. And sharpshooters were uh, executed on sight if they were caught because of their sort of ruthless habits. Um, and so Homer gives us this large-scale magazine illustration of this man in the treetop, and then also, I think, relative to our subject today, this comical image from a series of photographs he did called Life in Camp shows one of these Union troops kind of hiding behind a tree, hoping to escape the trapping that had come up for come up for them. Uh, Homer goes to the Civil War front in 1862, and again in 1864, he's bivouacked with family friends. He's living a very good life. It's not clear that he actually sees battle, but he's creating works like this, which purport to tell what battle was like to New York audiences. Uh, when he does represent a kind of skirmish, this is the painting, small painting that you're on, or sorry, it's the New Britain Museum of Art called Skirmish in the Wilderness. You get a sense of the chaos of what battle would have been like in these heavily wooded areas uh, where there was an unseen enemy and no opportunity to really uh, do anything but fire blindly into the woods. And so this is the kind of work that he does, perhaps born out of experience, although there's nothing to suggest that he actually saw this kind of battle. I think it's interesting for us tonight to think about a painting like this in light of what it says about the forest and the kind of 
experience that Homer had as still a young artist and a related painting, I think, uh, to this is this one called a um, trooper meditating beside a grave, where that same forest is now populated in part with the dead bodies of the Union and Trust. And, and you don't need to know much about Homer's appearance except for um, the death of the leader of the Union Trust is like a soft cold. And he has this beard and kind of a long mustache and shows up in his works as a kind of self-reference. So he at least identified enough with the experience of these combatants in the forest that he wanted to show them and learn them in this book. Um, Homer, at this point, is not sure he wants to become a fine artist. He's actually making a really good living as a commercial artist, and he decides at one point that he's going to put a few paintings into a shop front in Boston, and if they sold, he would then become a fine painter. But it, unbeknownst to him, um, his brother bought everything in that <laughs> shop and then sort of set him on a path to becoming a an oil painter. And uh, one of the works that I want to return to later is this image, which famous image which we know Homer could not have actually occupied this viewpoint. It's a scene from the Confederate side looking back towards the Union um, uh, line through this field of trees which have been uh, chopped up. It's uh, clear that this is because the, in this case, Petersburg, Virginia, this rebel soldier has become so bored by the tedium of the fight that he has mounted the ramparts and just hurling insults at the Union troops on the other side. And it's pretty tough to become a poet with the country on your side. And I think that's where Homer chooses this moment to show his sacrifice in the Civil War from a perspective he could not have had. Now, I think that's as close to making a statement about the battles as Homer comes in his Civil War career. As I mentioned, he goes to France, like many American artists, almost immediately after, goes to um, the same places that you'd find artists like Daubigny and Corot. That is, he went to the forests of Fontainebleau, and he's painting in this Barbizon manner, doing these very um, carefully rendered glimpses of bits of nature, these trees, which end up as a step in each case, and maybe making their way into these rustic compositions of the American farmhouse, for which he becomes really famous in the 1870s. Like this is his moment, and as he becomes the painter, the genre painter of the American farmland in this post-Civil War moment. Um, but he's also attracted, as many artists are, to what are called the North Woods. Which the North Woods is this ambiguous term. It could really refer for the wood to the wood from Maine to Minnesota at this point, or it could be very specifically the woods in the Adirondacks. And in Homer's case, he's guided by books like Murray's Adventures in the Ad Adirondacks to this almost religious uh, sense of what the American forests offered uh, the city dweller, which Homer was up until this point, quite the city dweller. So he goes out and paints these, I would say, French influence scenes of nature, and he's following this now pretty well-worn path to the Adirondacks. Um, we see him making, again, this is Homer going into his apartment, which is very busy, um, sitting in this tree stump littered uh, space, maybe a bow slightly at or above the tree line in the White Mountains, where he's showing the uh, appeal of this for young artists like himself, who are um, sort of taken in by this inventive story and the fact that he couldn't believe that this wasn't a joke painting, but he insists he saw it and thought it was a joke painting. So this is Homer and then another artist. This is another of the artists all the way out to the horizon, right, with um, just everybody going to this kind of new locale and trying to paint the wilderness. And, and of course, he's translating some of this work into commercial illustrations. Um, Homer is best known as a painter of the male sphere, although he, at this moment, does paint these um, ambiguous and unidentifiable women in the forest. So paintings like Autumn on the left or Shall I Tell Your Fortune are really open to extraordinary exploration and interpretation of what he's about. But what we know is immediately after this, women drop out entirely from his body of work, that this is sort of the last uh, appearance of women, and it happens to be in these forested environments. Instead, what you get is this homosocial sphere, which for Homer is 
the life that the wilderness provides, and specifically the forest wilderness in the Adirondacks of this year. So I'm just, for purposes of comparison, showing you a work called Campfire, um, a large image of an inset, one of these scenes of Civil War battle, which again, we think probably Homer must have observed at Yorktown, just asking you to um, think with me that maybe these two things share a common approach, right? Um, but he's going to the Adirondacks and he starts in the 1870s doing images like this again, showing what the hunting life would be like for adventurous New Yorkers who want to explore that place. Again, the hunt going on is something that uh, he would have participated in himself. He was a avid, I shouldn't say avid, he was a, a interested hunter and a great fisherman. And so he's sending these images back at $60 a pop to um, be published in Harper's Weekly. But what he's really interested in are the people who are hanging out in the Adirondacks. So he um, is painting the guides that if Michel goes and spends a week in the Adirondacks, he had to hire a guide who would take him <coughs> to this Florida coastal environment. And you know the names of Rufus and Dana in this painting. And they were well-known figures within this community of forest dwellers at his time. And Homer paints them in this heroic manner. This is a large painting. It's probably at least as large as it appears on the screen right now in person. Um, so it was meant to give them a kind of commanding presence. And it's around this time in 1888 that he joins this group of preservationists in the Northwoods Club. So the Northwoods Club was a private entity that was inspired to save as much of the forested lands of the Adirondacks as possible. They had a goal of preserving 4,000 mi square miles of uh, un uninterrupted forest lands. They got it about 4,000 acres. So they were it fell way short of their goals. But Homer joins in 1888. And he goes there virtually every year for the rest of his life. So he's spending a week or two weeks in this remote place today near Minerva, so someplace up in the Hudson River Valley. I'm just showing you a letter that Homer wrote to him if he was to go to this Northwoods Valley and bring his brother with him to enjoy this kind of wooded place. The important thing to know about this moment in the history of the Adirondacks is that it is terrain that is under attack. So there is a huge concern for the preservation, conservation of these forested lands at, the, at this time. And Homer is interested in that. So you have artists like Seneca Race um, Stoddard, this great photographer of the 19th century, showing the deforestation that is happening in the Adirondacks at this time. At the very moment that Homer is painting these delicate watercolors of the people who are actually creating that deforestation. And so there's, I think ambiguity to these works, Art, American art historians, I'm looking at Sarah, uh, tended to look at these things as these heroic images of man and nature. In fact, there's an alternative reading to these that these are profound critique of what is happening uh, to the Adirondacks at this, very, at this very moment. So a little watercolor like this one, which has the title North Woods Club, Club the interrupted tete-a-tete, -tete. so these two deer are sort of becoming aware of the artist. That is something that's under threat and for which Homer will become a major theme of the next 10 years of his work. And in the same way, these felled trees and these, um, they're not poachers, they're just um, unauthorized lumbermen who are clearing out these spaces. Uh, they're not quite meant to be heroic. These are meant to be scoundrels, right? And, and we know this because a painting like this, which tends to get read as uh, part of this package of Homer's interest in the hunting sporting life is really a condemnation of the kind of illegal hunting that was going on throughout the Adirondacks at this time. So this young man who's sort of meant to be a kind of brutish figure has, uh, in a, a way that Homer would have despised, chased this deer out into the middle of the lake where it's, it's being killed and his dogs are participating in this. These were the people that Homer uh, wanted to vilify for the rest of his time. And, and we know this too because the critics were aware of this, even though um, when I was taught these things, that wasn't their interpretation. Uh, a painting like this one, A Huntsman and Do Dogs, was described um, by the critic um, 
Alpha Tremble as one of the least attractive pictures the artist has painted. It is a bit of cold, uncompromising realism. The type of huntsman is low and brutal in the extreme. He's the sort of scoundrel who hounds deer to death up in the Adirondacks for the couple of dollars the hide and cords bring in. And of course, so he's left the body of the deer where, where it was killed, and he's just taking out the hide. And this for Homer was the most unappealing form of sportsmanship, and something he could not bear. Um, ask you to think back to that image I showed you of the battlefield outside of Petersburg inviting a shot, and these images that Homer makes of deer drinking where um, they become victim to these unsportsmanlike hunters of this time. And there's this whole rhetoric around the nobility of the animals in the Adirondacks, which Homer was aware of and would have seen these paintings as um, deliberately inviolate. That, so I won't read you this poem, but Rawson is basically saying that some of these deer are known to the hunters and they are um, never killed because of their status within the hierarchies of these wilderness places. And so Homer almost takes us um, Moybridge-like through the succession of images of a deer drinking, a uh, deer shot, or we are put into the um, anger of fire of the deer in this case. So I just point that out. Uh, a deer shot here. And again, that same tuft of bright So I think that's a, an alternative reading of what hum, Homer was up to when he was painting these things, which are still talked about at places like the National Gallery of Art as these great mythic images of American heroic wildlife, whereas I think it's, it's actually quite the opposite intention on Homer's part, that this is a kind of dastardly deed that's displayed in the, the wilderness. Um, but uh, when Homer is producing, and he produced dozens of these watercolors, and certainly similar, smaller number of oil paintings. Uh, they were received back in Boston and other places as among the most important images being painted by anybody at the time. So in this uh, short quote I'm going to read to you from the Boston Evening Transcript, it's, it's said that he's giving a wonderfully vivid idea of the immense scale of things, the wilderness, the grandeur, the rudeness, and almost oppressive solitude of the great New England forest. It's like inhaling a breath of balsamic air from the big woods, full of stimulating and expansive life. I want to say yes, but it was in addition to that, all of these other things. And so I'm going to end with this, I think, um, very ambiguous image uh, that Homer creates called Old Friends, where you've got this giant tree and then this sort of fondly caressing woodsman who's about to take it down, right? So that's the message. And it is part of a whole discourse. Uh, it's important to remember the Sierra Club was founded in San Francisco in 1892. The North Woods Club was founded in Minerva, New York in 1888. So they're part of the same preservationist movement. And Homer is in concert with John Muir when he says, few that fell the trees, plant them, nor would planting avail much toward getting back anything like the noble primeval forest. God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand straining, leveling tempests and floods, but he cannot save them from fools. And Homer was completely aware of that sentiment and shared it. Thanks. Okay. So... So I thought we'd begin with that important appendix 30, which is going to be a look at a whole array of um, ways of thinking about um, the forest by artists I'm interested in, but that lead somewhere else, <laughs> I guess I would say. And then I'm going to close right in on um, one artist whose work believes that forest is utterly central to the whole uh, body of work I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in. So we're overlapping a little bit. We're here at the Forest of Fontainebleau, um, where Homer had been um, for a time. And we're looking at the work of Pedro Busso. Um, and this is actually a chalk drawing of my pan paper. Um, so that warm color and so on is, 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 is this kind of marble, you could say, of paper, pastel, and chalk. 
um, yeah. <clears throat> and here we find the forest in winter at sunset, um, again by Rousseau. Um, and rather parallel with Homer, Rousseau and other artists painting in the forest of Fontainebleau were actually very actively about preserving the forest as it were. So there was a, an effort to plant trees which they considered inappropriate um, and unaccompanying trees or species and so on. They worked concertedly over time to, to help preserve, um, preserve the forest, um, in fact. But I want to look here also at this tangle of, um, tangle of branches and so on um, that he's now focusing on in Homer. Um, so that we see a very much sort of in this, in this thicket. Um, and it conveys very much the sense of sort of um, there was a bigger picture and um, and sort of a path out the other side would be that is there is there is already a kind of hopeful sense of the um, of the, the the presence of the forest as something that isn't um, isn't necessarily set up for us and so too I want to show you quickly um, a view of um, Gustave Courbet, The Rituals in the Forest of Fontainebleau, um, 1855. These are all early novelizations, so these are not kind of the groups that we're starting with. Um, here we find the daughter of a distressed aunt um, in a cloth hat. The prince is in clothes or but supply, rather painful, um, we've seen in, in Rousseau's work. And then um, a work that signals, um, in a sense, the ways that people work in, with, and perhaps against um, the forest. So Rosa Bonheur, the, the forest of Fontainebleau is probably 40 miles southeast of, of Paris. Rosa Bonheur, um, a, a quite extraordinary, successful um, mid-century painter, largely of animals um, or other large scale, lived very close to the forest of Fontainebleau and, and took regular walks. She's not there in the book walks through the forest of Fontainebleau. Here she focuses in on actually a scene now not of raw nature, but not surprising to her, um, focusing on animals. Um, and we have the charcoal burners, um, in fact, of, 18, um, of 1853. Um, in this case, they are making um, charcoal from oak. So they're, they're, they're cutting, cutting trees um, for material. Um, the process of actually making this charcoal is an intense process, heat drive, so they actually have to take up residence in the forest of Fontainebleau to be making um, charcoal um, and sort of stay with Nova Plain until they've completed the process and, and, and set off. Um, okay, Cezanne too will think about the forest. Here the forest path, and this perhaps suggests that sense of the canopy that we think of in terms of the forest, but not for long with Cezanne. This is a work he makes late in his life um, over a period of time. This particular group is 19, 1903 to 1904. He works slowly on images that look perhaps like they could have been done rather hastily. Um, but in other images of this parallel moment, probably simultaneously with them, um, you find him keen his attention about and as well, turning his attention to the tension between um, the making of the image and what the image shows us, and thus the, the, the strokes of paint and so on become a, a kind of protagonist in the painting. Um, and in the paintings of this time, um, it may be mentioned that Charles Henry Cook was working on conservatism in these years. Um, there is this sense that he scrutinizes um, the landscape. Here again, I'm bend in the forest road. Um, it would seem that one of the things he's doing in scrutinizing the landscape, so this might, might look like it wouldn't require him to be there um, for every bit of the painting of it, but indeed he was absolutely ardent that he needed to be in front of what he was painting. Um, not because he actually moved increasingly close to what it appeared to be um, in its appearance, but because it would seem that one of the sort of things he's working through is particularly with the brushwork, is the sort of making visible within the painting of the relationship of 
whom you would serve with, the person registering with your family and with your friends, um, which is this same sort of construct. So we see, we see this gathering of aid, we see the calls, but we see it just registering in us in a big feeling way um, as we have a look at the text. Kazimir Malevich, an artist we might not associate um, with images of the forest, um, here early on in about 1908, um, creates this river in the forest um, painting um, about as naturalistic as you're ever gonna see him in terms of his, his work. But won't be long before he turns his attention to wood fire and this call that um, now seems a kind of almost mechanical sort of um, labor-like um, form in terms of figure and action and so on. Um, and this will lead rather promptly, if the first image was 1908 by 1912, um, Malevich will have arrived at Sokanovi's painting, It Yet Left Handed. Um, And he's moved from that sort of observation of the world toward, toward what we would consider non-objective painting, literally no object in it. Um, it is instead meant to be, as he would speak about it, write about it, a desert of pure feeling, as he would describe it. Um, it is meant to not um, look like the world, but to speak of the world, um, as he would have said. And all of this will culminate in White on White of 1918, um, about as Sakanovi says, Death. Um, I wanted to show you the work of Kate Mondrian. Here, um, as with other early paintings, he turned to nature. It is the origin um, of, of, of most of his early work. Um, here, Woodmere Alley, <coughs> a painting of um, 1980. And it's a sort of moody sense of the world um, with these unnatural colors, perhaps of a sunset. Suggestion, but there is an, also a sort of intimation of his um, ultimately arriving at composition for a different instrument, a cello or a violin, as we have seen. So here's a clear um, intimate appeal, as well as almost a kind of romantic look to water and so on, to the, to, to the way that this has been put together. Um, from a view like this, that sort of plunks us in the middle of nature, I would say, we're there, you know, and we can feel ourselves um, he would begin rather methodically and quickly in a painting, for example, of the same year to distance himself from that sort of sense of, of the nursery in nature. And so here's Blue Tree of 1908, again much smaller and with often it appears um, a blue tree or probably it's a brick hut, um, not that large. Um, and what we, I think, begin to see is he's focusing on one tree and he's creating the, the sense of the um, the sense of the sort of profile of the tree and not apparently natural natural colors. Um, this will lead to images like gray tree of 1908 and, and 1911 rather. Um, here um, in fact again a painting about this wide and simple and this not quite as um, grand in scale but it appears here. Um, no doubt alert to cubism, alert to the kind of use of neutral colors grays and dun colors um, by cubist artists beginning to simplify, abstract perhaps, the elements of that tree um, that he looks at. Um, this will uh, continue in flowering apple tree of 1912. And so too in apple tree of 1912 in which we have these mighty crests and this um, sense of being in the, in the thick of nature. Now this process um, for Mondrian was actually related to his um, really mulling over how art should work in nature. And he wrote extensively and compellingly. And what he felt was that in the past centuries of the world that we are in the thick of, the world that we look at, there is an underlying tragic quality. Um, we are finite, um, it doesn't last, and so on. And instead he began to work as you see, toward arriving at here composition in black and white, composition with color planes, uh, work toward a kind
kind of distillation of the elements that he had found in nature, um, ultimately to produce what I think you could call what the, the art historian Isai Abra has spoken of as kind of painting as model, um, not describing or looking like the world, but actually by a kind of analogy of sorts, um, able to speak of the world. So he began to work toward what he would again write about, speak about as a dynamic equilibrium. Um, so a painting like this has been stripped down to primary colors, white and black. The relationship to colors is, are extremely carefully wrought um, by Mark Dupin. And what this principle brings is that there not be symmetry, there not be balance, but that there be what he called this dynamic equilibrium, that it be the tensions that he thinks are inherent um, in existence, in the world, in the workings of the world, and so on. Um, and this becomes then this sort of um, this, this non-objective way of making paintings that become, as he put it, real abstractions. So when you see the Mark Dupin portraits, you will find that they are not framed. Um, they are actually mounted with a, 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 on, a, on something behind them. That is, the painting is advanced toward us rather than um, is as a, a kind of picture that they might recede perhaps away from us. He wanted them to be real. He wanted them to be actual. He wanted them to be in our face. Um, he wanted the experience to be that um, that kind of um, what it was that we were seeing, not what it was representing. A sense of likeness. It could it could speak of things, but not realize them. Um, on the other hand, I wanted to show you much smaller in real life a surrealist forest, um, the work of the artist Mark Dillon. Um, here he begins with what he calls the high, he puts something under the, the surface he's working on and then rubs across it to, to get a kind of spontaneous projection of where this might go. Um, an effort to sort of um, do away with kind of intention calculations of where the, the paint was ending. And then would follow the lead um, of all of this. The abstract expressionist painter um, Lee Krasner in 1955 creating this forest, as she titles it. Here, in this case, much bigger than it looks. It's about five, about five feet high. <coughs> I think it's a couple more shoulder length, if you want to um, turn our attention. Um, I wanted to actually show you a couple of works by the Spanish-born but Mexican, in terms of her career, artist Remedio Faro. Um, working here in this realm of a kind of um, magical conjuring of images. Here called Caravan, she configures in a kind of this architectural um, realm where it's um, a space of real scenes. It's a kind of scene by scene kind of a kind of um, wooded scenario. Or Stevador, in which the forest is animal, um, in fact, um, is a scene um, at rest as we go from one scene from within the conjuring from the imagination. So here the forest has figured again and again. Um, the artist of happenings, Alan Capwell, here creating what he titled the Forest Yam Festival. It was a happening, and the uh, basic instructions to those who participated were that they were to crouch down, holding in each of them a sapling. So what you have is this sort of field of 100 people crouching down at the, um, at the farm of Joel Siegel in New Jersey, um, each holding a sapling the center of a hill. Pop artist Roy Lichtenstein's forest scene with figures of 1987. Very large scene. This is about, I don't know, this is about um, 16 feet wide. And once more, um, to close this little prelude, once more um, a happening, which here is an easy dimension to him. What I want to really focus on, however, is 
um, an artist for whom the forest, the woods, and what is next to it, near it, um, is absolutely central to a body of work that gives the state incredibly strong imagination. So we're looking at a series called Night Coming Tenderly Black. Um, it's a series in which the negatives were made in 2017, the prints came in um, 2018. So the images um, center on, and actually the scale is not that, um, in terms of the size of the images, they're probably um, 44 by 55 or so comfortably. Um, in any case, a series of 25 images focus on the journey of escape from slavery um, to freedom along the Underground Railroad. And Dolly Day was asked to look, look at sites in Ohio to think about a project and discovered that there were, there were very active groups, particularly around Cleveland and um, Hudson, um, of, of, of movement along the Underground Railroad. And this became then the project. Um, the title, Night Coming Tenderly Black, comes from a Langston Hughes poem called Dream Variations, a poem of 1924, which closes with night coming tenderly, black like midnight. Um, the format is important. These are large, as I say, images, um, and they are black and white. Um, Dolly Day, I, I would say, for quite a long time has worked largely in color in those photos. Yeah, um, but for this series, turn to black and white. And I think this is significant in terms of how these work. Um, they're Della and Silver prints. Um, they are framed and glazed, so you have to look carefully to see what you're seeing. Um, I, I think as well. So I'm going to show you some images and then talk a little bit about what each of them means. So here, I'm titled number two from the series. I'll just tell you this as the sub subtitles are all I'm titled with numbers. These are John Hill. He would observe about these works, and I'm talking to the Whitney Museum, that, and I'm quoting him here, history, he speaks incredibly movingly of his work. Um, and I would have tried to have him speaking um, at some of the interviews, but I, my technology is not up to it, so I'm not quite going to come. But in any case, he focuses observing history and its retelling tends to become mythic. And that is certainly true in the case of the Underground Railroad, because those locations, most of them were never really known. I had some specific sites that I knew were related, and I started to look at the landscape around and in between those sites, trying to look at the contemporary landscape as if it were the landscape of the past, and trying to see through the eyes of the fugitive African-American escaping from slavery, moving across that landscape under the cover of darkness. So certainly he's, it's clear that there, the routes were not known. They needed to be history, or there are certain sites that are known and so on, but they needed to change. They needed to be not public, publicly um, declared and so on. Um, and he did find one trait. Yes, one trait. And here I'm going to suggest that this give you a feel of how you have to look at these prints. There's a lot of information in the negatives, which I think is very bad. So you really have to search. You have to search this image. And it, it's a little bit sort of like your eyes have to adjust when you're, you know, when you're in a, a space without light. But it also slows you down and it puts you in a very particular relationship and it's like reading um, images. This was the playground gate house. It's within the now the city of Cleveland. Um, it is one place that's not certainly known to have been um, a station on the Underground Railroad, but very likely um, was a place. And of course, it wasn't really a railroad. It was a it was a path. It was a path of of, um, of people 
to be sheltered by uh, Muncie faculty. Most were initially, uh, after 1850, to Canada it was possible, by the 1850s it became possible to readjust people who had escaped to the north um, and to Canada. Um, so, so, so the groups we looked at used their lake Erie. Um, they were the ones who most were raised with the Niagara Falls Lake Erie in Ontario. <coughs> so Ferguson, once again, it was the movement through the landscape of Jesus of slaves with the assistance of what came to be called various underground railway stations. Places that they targeted them along with those people who aided them as they fled toward Canada. Um, indeed, many of the routes of the Underground Railway led to those lakes that at that time were so um, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Erie, the Niagara River, bodies of water which were used at times to connect to, um, to what was then, I guess, British North America and the Sea. Um, it's the French that come to mind most. Am I right? Great. Okay. <laughs> So, in talking about the title, um, he observed that there was something for him wonderful about using that, sort of thinking of that last line of the poem, so as to think about blackness as something that can be tended, a space of tender black and white moving towards freedom. So he was an author who think about the darkness of that kind of movement. It was, of course, he acknowledges always it's not a literal description of what beauty was. It, 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 it was meant to, it meant to not be literal, but instead actually um, to create, I think, a particular sense of experience for the viewer, um, I guess is one thing to say. So uh, one thing to notice is that there are no figures in the book in these images, and only places. And the scale of the images, I think, is perhaps in the images. But we're the ones that can begin to really see these landscapes as we see them, um, as we look at them in, in some imagined, uh, imagined um, kind of way. I mean, when I look at these images, I feel like I'm kind of grasping at something in some way. I mean, as a kind of person, I mean, literally, visually, you're sort of grasping to find your bearings, but also in the way that you sense the space. Um, and though there is, of course, not sound and so on, you can imagine the kind of alertness, um, alertness that you would have to sound, um, especially to light, um, to smell, um, that came unexpectedly, um, the things that could be very muted but could be signals. Um, he observed, actually, that in works like this, he's trying to make works that don't depend on the physical presence of the black subject in the photograph for the work to be about the black subject. And he also spoke about the idea um, that he was hoping that he was seeing space through their eyes, the eyes of the people who made these um, drawings. Um, again, not by depicting them, but trying to sort of inhabit um, in some way that experience. Um, so too, um, he was clear that in making these, he wanted the photographs to move beyond being an archetype, an object to being an experience, um, an experience for those um, who encountered them. Again, the sense of the difficulty of making the way through all of this. Um, you know, he's all the all the all the graves of this kind are both inhospitable and they're profoundly difficult um, as well. So let's just scroll through. Um, 
gosh, it's right there. I'm going to show you a brighter point here. Just to show you how much deeper you can see. And all of the, not just my point, but your point too. It's kind of nice. It's just the deeper you can see all the information that's in the, in the lens of that point. Not whether it is or not. And in terms of how these are framed these days and what they're most visible to, um, very simply, there's a, a simple frame here on the very left um, that gives you a, a, a bit of a feel of, of that. So we then, we then kind of also moved along to having moved in away from architecture as a reason to deny architecture into the world to now turn to the religion a bit back toward, um, again, a, a, a group of um, upset and disappointed people who were broken and, and hostile. Bonhoeffer and Peter Kemp, too. Um, and then we come to near Lake Erie. And here we are up on a bluff above Lake Erie, looking across Lake Erie, if you could see 50 miles to see Canada. Um, Now, in speaking about this image, um, he actually gave a fascinating talk at the National Gallery of Art. And I spoke at this image, and I'm, I'm going to show it to you. It's, it's um, I think it's, yeah, it's compelling. This was the baby step, the end of that journey, and then from this point, 50 miles across to Canada. When I was setting up to make this particular photograph, I had an experience that I had not had in the year and a half that I had been making, um, making photographs. It was an experience that let me know that this probably was an actual site, because as I was setting up to make this photograph, I inexplicably felt the presence of hundreds of eyes watching me from both sides. And that was not anything I was looking to find. I was not looking to have that kind of experience. I was thinking strictly in terms of how to make photographs that describe what might have been. But the feeling that I got for the time that I was standing at this site, overlooking Lake Erie, which one would have had to pass by in order to get to Lake Erie, gave me a profound sense that I was, in fact, standing at an actual site in the Great Depression. And then finally, the last of the images of, of the trees is Lake Erie in the fall, 2016. When first I saw this, I thought, huh, this is this sort of breakthrough. This is, you know, I mean, I, I think you can kind of see that we, we, we sort of made it. But then I thought of, oh my gosh, <laughs> 50 miles is a long, a long distance. Um, so it, so it um, indeed, you know, remains, you know, it, 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 it maintains the tension, I guess. It maintains the tension, um, the sense of, um, of, the, um, of the artist in a sense, um, of all of this. So I think I'll stop there. So um, Brian asked me to uh, talk about the forest and representation in the, my intro photo class here, so I'm definitely going to do that. But he also asked me to talk about Freud, <laughs> Sigmund, um, not Lucian or any other art figures. Um, and so en route to that kind of productive triangulation, I had to find a way in. And the, the first kind of artwork that kind of came to mind for me was this artwork that, does anybody know anything about Soviet nonconformist work? So th this is what came up for me. Um, it's, a, it's a work from 1976 from uh, a Soviet nonconformist group called Collective Actions. And uh, I think, in fact, Ilya Kabakov was in this group, or at this particular action. I think he just died like two days ago, right? Um, so, out of respect. Um, the kind of brief, brief history that would lead us up to this kind of weird moment at the outskirts of Moscow uh, next to a forest is Malevich. You've got this amazing experimental um, phase of artwork that foments the revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, stabilizes under Stalin uh, as he's trying to kind of stabilize 
kind of, um, <laughs> the Soviet Union um, and, and uses art to do that, um, becomes very, very strict about what kind of art gets made, um, begins to thaw a bit, and then under Khrushchev you've got um, an exhibition in 1962 wherein some artists are starting to pull through some of those abstract threads from earlier in the century as well as um, kind of touch on some stuff that they've seen from the West. Khrushchev freaks out and says, no more, we've got to go back to the socialist realist stuff. And, and they and they really begin again to enforce um, a kind of uh, stricture around what kind of art can get made, which of course creates its opposite, the binary, the nonconformist. So you have in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, a lot of people uh, finding ways to express themselves. Um, and they have to do this either in apartment shows, uh, which are called kvartirniks, after the word for apartment, uh, where they play rock music and they show pictures of their girlfriends naked and they do all this kind of stuff. Or they have to go to the countryside and you know get out of town, out of the purview of the government. And they have to be very careful about um, who they invite, right? Because you don't want to get told on to a government that will um, not look kindly on your uh, notion of what art is. This is a kind of the same period as, as happenings, and, and Claire Bishop, if anyone's interested in the comparison, has written a really beautiful essay comparing Western performance work to this, to this kind of stuff, um, in which she kind of carves out this space for, for the idea that even the participants in this work would not have known necessarily that they're in an artwork. You know, they go, they meet at the edge of this forest, they're given this and then um, they, uh, they're they asked to unspool a piece of thread and walk toward the forest um, until they can't see anyone. And then once they've done that, they realize the thread isn't connected. They're utterly alone. <laughs> and about eight of the 30 people ended up making their way back to the field, at which time they were presented with a photograph of another person leaving the forest and walking back toward the field. And it's just far enough away that you can't tell that it's not you. But it's 1976, so of course it's not a print that was just made of you. And yet you're recognizing yourself in this thing that's not you, just as you've come from the forest, which is not your home, but feels more like home, because you can be yourself there. And you can't at home. OK, I'm getting to Freud. Uh, <laughs> Um, so these are the two ways that I got into Freud. The idea that a photograph can at once show you the thing that is not the thing, the self that is not the self, and, um, and the idea that in order to uh, feel comfortable, feel at home, feel native in some way, you might actually have to leave home um, and, and go somewhere as terrifying as this incredibly cold Moscow field of snow and trees. Um, this is them walking towards the trees. <laughs> and so <laughs> the work that I kind of came to um, after thinking about that piece was um, was The Uncanny uh, by, by Freud. And I just want you to note how much time he spends in this essay parsing the word. All those highlight words are the word heimlich or unheimlich. And, and it's all him saying, what is canny, what is uncanny, what is home, what is native? It's impossible to translate. That's why he spends so much time on it. Um, um, but he, he comes up with basically this, this kind of conversation in his head around the, the fact that um Heimlich is obviously the opposite of Heimlich, meaning familiar and native, belonging to the home. And we are tempted to conclude that what is uncanny is frightening precisely because it's not known and familiar. And then he starts making fun of this guy who just leaves it there, who just says, OK, uh, the uncanny is basically unfamiliar. Um, Freud doesn't agree. He actually thinks it's a lot deeper and more complicated and more terrifying than that. He says the uncanny is that class of the frightening, which leads back to what is known of old and long familiar. OK. So it's not going to be these next few slides. And, as <laughs> and this is not to say I don't respect these artists. But what I'm doing, and I love it that actually Sally mentioned quite a few of the artists that I, I will. But we're pursuing different questions. The question of this particular thought experiment that I'm performing for you is, uh, is, is where is the uncanny in a number of very successful pictures of forests. 
Um, Justine Kurland is one of Greg Crudson's grad students when she starts making these. She's inviting undergrads, some of my friends, out into the forest. Um, I wanted to print, so I stayed in the dark room. I didn't go. Um, <laughs> but she's inviting them out into the forest to do these weird little things as if they're, you know, I mean, it's not that weird. They're just sitting at the edge of the, you know, forest, the river, basically kind of um, out just beyond the purview of their parents, maybe any, any sort of institutional purview, um, doing what they need to do. Um, I'm not sure if for me, and none of, these, none of these ended up sitting for me as I was looking through them in that space that is so close to home that it's terrifying or so far away from home that you can see yourself, that like weird little sliver that Freud's trying to isolate. Also another student of Greg's, um, uh, Anna Gaskell, um, taking young people out to the forest, um, sometimes leaving them in houses, but in my pictures. Uh, out to the forest um, in order to not only kind of free themselves, find themselves the way Justine was working, but actually to kind of perform rituals of sorts. Um, she starts using boys later. She wasn't using boys in the early, but anyway, there they are performing these like strange almost rituals, quasi rituals. And again, I'm not, you guys can disagree with me, I, I'm not sitting in this space. Maybe the thing about psychology is that it needs to trigger you. And for me, these don't get to that place of it's me, it's not me. Um, the other one that I just assumed I was going to feel uncanny about was Tomas de Mond. Um, and if anyone has ever stood in front of Tomas de Mond's work, um, you know that the entire conceit really is that it is both a photograph of a thing and not a photograph of a thing. So each of these leaves is handmade out of paper. Um, and <laughs> and you can kind of see that he's he's gone to great lengths. There he is hiding on the left side of the big picture there. Um, he's gone to great lengths to light it so that the light filters through in exactly the way it would in a forest, to print it at scale such that you th feel like you're looking through a window um, at a real forest, and yet you are to feel, as you stand in front of it, this kind of um, uh, something's off. Um, I, I'm going to say I, I am not, not going to own a feeling of uncanniness or there's something wrong with my psychology if that's... <laughs> it's just not triggering me. But you can kind of see it a little bit better in, in this one, um, that the leaves are, are um, too perfect um, to be uh, real. So I guess I, I, I began to feel like I needed to find out why or in what moment uh, psychoanalysis would have even come to bear on the photographic work anyway. Why simply apply it as an aesthetic theory? Um, if, if I could look for more specific wounds um, and entry points. So I, I started to think about like what was happening um, during its development and before it begins to be applied specifically to artwork. You've got Einstein developing theories of general relativity at the turn of the century, which is blowing up our notions of space and time. You've got Freud making uh, you know, theories into the unconscious, blowing up our notions of our internal sense of space and time. You've got Marx blowing up our sense of like how you know social sphere works, um, and um, and art is responding to it even before World War One. You've got Schoenberg writing atonally and Malyarm writing poetry that, you know, um, is scrambled syntax and Picasso working in cubism to, to kind of uh, you know work with these Einstein's theories of of, of um, space and time's conflation, and then suddenly you've got World War One where. Nothing, nothing makes sense. So everything that we've just kind of like dissected um, with Einstein, Freud, and Marx, suddenly humanity is faced with itself and doesn't recognize itself. People are having to kill on a scale they've never understood before, and they're doing it face to face. And, and ships, dazzle ships are painted um, in, in these kinds of ridiculous patterns. And um, what ends up happening, of course, and all of my art history in this, in this lecture is incredibly abbreviated, but what ends up happening is you get data and a bunch of nonsense, right? People saying, well, the world makes no sense. Um, but instead of leaving it there, I'll, I'll, I'll imagine um, that, that you can come along with me to the idea that the surrealists wanted more, the, the kind of ensuing movement wanted more from the potential of psychoanalysis and um, relativity, that, that you could get into yourself. You could actually find yourself through nonsense. Um, and uh, you see this develop in all the journals and artworks as it, as it reaches out into 
uh, questions of decolonization and anti-fascism and um, uh, a lot of the really interesting conversations that are happening after World War II, before World War, uh, after World War One, and before World War II. Um, and you'd think that it translated into kind of a more overt politics in photographs of trees, um, but but <laughs> but it doesn't. And and the strange part about it is that I feel more uh, of the uncanny in some of the photographs that are interwar images from people who are really implicated or impacted by the interwar period. And um, so I'll show you a few from that period and then move up into contemporary work that kind of maintains the, the wounded space. Um, Renger Petsch, you know, he's, he's looking at forests. This is a guy, a German, um, who is teaching in Essen when the Nazi um, uh, kind of program of, of the arts takes over the university and he leaves that post. And when I look at these photographs, whether it's the kind of misty forest or the vulnerable young tree in a snowdrift, um, I am just really thrown by, by the sense of how much the world is changing around him and, and he's choosing to change and leave and do whatever he does. And we're not gonna go into biography here, but uh, that that young tree surviving in this strange springy field um, is, is his picture from 1929. I, I, I don't really wanna look at a lot of German artists though. I don't have a lot of experience with them. I, I, I feel like the, the, the French um, connection is gonna work better for my argument um, <laughs> or for my psychology. So I started looking through Minotaur and all these old journals for Max Ernst, uh, was one of the first people who came up for me. He begins to talk about the forest in writing and then also in pictures. This essay, you know, it, essay, poem, whatever you want to call it, um, it's a surreal kind of a, a work. Um, it makes, makes very little obvious sense initially. What is a forest? A wonderful insect, a drawing board. What do forests do? They never go to bed at a good hour. They're waiting for the tailor. Um, <laughs> what are forests for? To make ta matches that we give to children as toys. Um, but as it goes on and on, you get the sense that the forest is becoming a really bodily thing. So where I might have just felt the metaphor of the uncanny and the vulnerable and the Renger Patch slim tree, here I'm starting to see it really overtly play out. Um, are there still forests there? They are, it seems, wild and impenetrable, black and red, extravagant, secular, anthills, diametrical, negligent, ferocious, fervent, and amiable without yesterday or tomorrow. So this is really, um, and these are, these are photographs he made of forests from the same journal where you can feel some of this um, uh, more organic than they should be kind of perspective on forests. They're really bodily. Um, and they're 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 like inelegantly framed, right? Like this is not Ansel Adams trying to make uh, Yosemite look perfect. This is a confrontation with uh, an inner self. Um, and Man Ray, another uh, photographer we associate with uh, surrealism, and Manuel Rudnitsky, um, uh, looking at forests again. There's no he doesn't he's not crafting paper paper leaves. Um, and he was not above or beyond experimentation. He loved it. I mean, he did it all the time. But in this case, he, he just looked at the forest. And um, I felt when I saw this that the photograph is kind of always already uncanny because it doesn't matter if you're looking at the photograph of the paper leaf or the photograph of the person who is not you. It is always something that's both here and not here. You know, you're always looking at something that's here, I mean, that's a forest. It's an index of a forest. It's a sign for a forest is very credible. And yet it's totally not there and, and I've never been there. And if, even if I had it, I was not there at that time. Um, so there's my little pilot sentence, but the photography is always already uncanny. Um, so then that, that gave me license to kind of look back through history and I'm back at the Forest of Fontainebleau. We can't get away from it today. Um, I'm with Gustave Le Gray. I've gone all the way back. Um, to basically right after photography is invented and, um, and, 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 and artists are, as, as has been said twice, um, <laughs> um, using the forest to look at light in, in, in painting. Um, and I don't, I don't feel an uncanniness in this picture. I love this picture. It's a gorgeous picture. 
Uh, everybody writes about this picture as though it's related in some kind of abstract concern uh, to like a Pollock. You know, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, love for this painting uh, f photograph. But I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the wound. So this is a this is a tree with wounded roots uh, in the forest of Fontainebleau, and um, and again, it's inelegantly framed. It's like those Max Ernst photographs where you're just kind of bumping up against the roots, and there's something almost wrong, like a skin disease going on in, in, in the Ernst photographs. In this one, it's almost like, did it die? No, it didn't fall over, but something happened. And you get this sense that you are witnessing something that transpired. You don't know exactly what. I'll say the same for Sally Mann. Beautiful photographs. I mean, you know, th those of you who know Sally's work uh, on her family's um, at her family's house uh, uh, with figures of her family members uh, may know that she spent a lot of time in the South photographing gorgeous landscapes. Um, but I'm going to say I feel more. Maybe it's too literal. Maybe it's too literal. But I'm I'm going to go with the fact that I I feel <laughs> I think psych psychoanalysis should apply to the the subject, right? And when I look at this, I feel the wound um, that that tree has suffered um, in 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 even more pertinent a way um, than I do with the the gray. Um, Friend of mine, Ken Gonzalez Day, really amazing series of conceptual works about hanging trees in in Southern California, um, where he's gone and taken archival images of trees where uh, multiple ethnicities um, uh, were were lynched and erased the figure so that you can actually focus on the the, the gaze and the and the viewership of 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 the people who were sick enough to want to watch. Um, but the trees are always really, really prominent, right? But, I, you know, I don't even like this one more than this one. I like this one more. <laughs> I'm going to be really subjective here. But at the same time, I feel the wound in this tree. Um, so I don't know. I think the reason I don't like this one as much is because it's digital, like, light is super flat. But, um, but at the same time, I, I really do feel the wound. He, he did switch to using digital at some point in this book. Um, and, and I'm arriving uh, back. I'm so, Sally, I'm so glad Sally explained this whole project to you so I don't have to. And I can just stay with my associative <laughs> conceit here. Um, but, but, you know, when I talk about this series, I usually talk about it, you know, in a photo class. I'm talking about how, you know, for me, this work really centers the subject. Every single picture is framed such that you are standing behind a tree, looking out around it, uh, a picket fence, like, as if you were cautiously approaching the house. You're not just like at the house. It's again, it's not a very kind of um, obvious framing, the kind of thing you would see uh, in a calendar <laughs> about this area. It's, 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 I'm standing behind the, also of course they're taken in moonless circumstances because the Underground Railroad, uh, obviously you would have walked on a dark night. You didn't want to be seen. And so his, his conceit of printing dark, as Sally put it, um, is also meant to suggest that you um, are, are walking in darkness um, this entire time. But yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not triggered by this picture. I am triggered by this one that she showed you too, the bent branches. And the same, I guess I was trying to see where are the wounds in the trees themselves. Um, and in this one in particular, when I look at it, I, I don't get a sense that I'm hiding, but I do get a sense that I'm standing there and I don't know if I'm implicated as the person who has run or the person who, who is, is chasing. This is a really tricky photograph for me because bent branches can, can mean both things. They can mean someone has left a clue for you or they can mean someone's chasing you or they can mean that you're chasing someone else. So I think this, this photograph holds for me a lot of the wounds of the South that maybe Sally was looking for um, in her photograph of the wounded tree. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, Brian, I don't know if I managed to triangulate forest and representation in Freud, but I feel like what, I came, what it came down to for me was, was that, um, was that uh, in order to be able to see, uh, you know, yourself in an other or find yourself in a non-native place, I think that sometimes you have to look instead of at the forest, at the trees. <laughs>